You know, now it's this very produced beauty, this very like, ah, uh, just um, Instagram aesthetic. You know, everything's photoshopped. Mm -hmm. But in day to day life, you know, the most beautiful moments are the cup of coffee that your spouse makes for you in the morning. You know, it's dropping your kids off at school and, and saying goodbye to them. Hello, and welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? That's this podcast. My name's John Hears, the director of First Things Foundation. This is our podcast. What we try to do is take a look at heavy things lightly. Philosophy, history, theology. We take a look at this stuff in modern culture, and we do it through a lens that we've acquired by working overseas for long periods of time in immersive developmental situations. We we try to help people in our in our work, and then we take all that stuff we learn and we throw it on this podcast. So this is episode 47 of Watar. Why are we talking about rabbits? This is a pretty cool conversation with a young guy who started a really cool website that he calls Rewire the West. This is episode 47. Can the West be rewired? Is there something about the West that is, that is in fact, in sort of transcendentally beautiful or eternally beautiful? What is it about the West that we want to um, remind ourselves of it or try to recover it? Can you can yeah. you speak to that? Because I think a lot of people listening would say, but the West is an idea and a reality, and there's something about it you love. What what is it you love about the West? Yeah. Because um, because I'll just finish with this. I know cats that are listening to this podcast that would say, Well, don't rewire the West, destroy it. Just let's bring back the East. So mm -hmm. how 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 would you not that we're arguing about it, but what how would you how would you sort out that? Yeah. Conversation. Well, I'd, I'd preface it all by saying, you know, this is not a superiority complex. It's not a, oh, the West is the supreme best culture of all time. It's not that. OK, mm -hmm. what it is, though, is it's recognizing that a people become impoverished when they get cut off from their roots. You know, you, you we just by nature, the way that the human species has grown up, you know, we have to have a history. We have to have. Uh, something that we connect to that's deeper, that goes into the past, that's, you know, bigger than all of us. And as a Westerner, the, obviously the West is my heritage, if you will, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's not that I think, oh, it's better than every other culture out there. It's just recognizing, wow, well, the West has accomplished some incredibly beautiful things. Mm -hmm. And it has, you know, created insanely beautiful um, works of art, incredible achievements, you know, it's instituted tons of reform, justice, whatever you want to call it in the world. Um, of course, it's not been perfect. No culture has been perfect, you know, mm -hmm. but it's, it's accomplished a lot of amazing things. And there have been so many remarkable and inspiring individuals to have come out of the West. In name some I, that you like. Name some of these principles, some of these principal actors or principal pieces of art that you like. I'm interested. Things yeah. that you would hold up. Absolutely. Well, okay. My one of my all-time favorite guys in all of history is the Marquis de Lafayette. I okay? saw that video. Yeah, go to his yeah. website. You can see this. He does a really nice job. By the way, you have history chops. I like it. Thanks. You're a nice narrator. <laughs> your your videos make sense to me. Yeah, I I taught history. It. I studied it. So I love for it. what it's yeah. worth, I mean, who knows? Thank you. But I like it. But go ahead. So Thank Lafayette, what, what's yeah. going on with him? So Lafayette, you know, he he grew up basically born on these enlightenment principles. And he basically, when he was young, you know, a, a teenager still, he got inspired by what was happening in America. He saw potential there and he said, I'm going to go over. And so when he was 18 years old, you know, sails to America, puts his own money down for a ship, helps the Americans in their cause and kind of what they're doing. Um, and then he comes back to France. That's not, I'm not going to focus on that. Just skip over that because the reason I like him is because he was a man of integrity and he was someone who took the beautiful aspects of, you know, these Western enlightenment ideals mm -hmm. and he put them into practice. I think, you know, for so many men at the time, he was really forward thinking. He was um, an ardent abolitionist. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he did is he, he didn't just say, 
you know, oh, you know, he didn't just postulate about it. He wasn't like, oh, we should get rid of slaves because of this, but, you know, not lift a finger about it. He actually had some conversations, you know, with some big players at the time and talked about, you know, what do we need to do here? And he understood that it wasn't just a black and white issue either. He knew that it wasn't, oh, you can't just erase slavery like immediately because as it stood then, it propped up a huge economy. You know, yeah. when you can't, the way the world worked, you just couldn't cut that out overnight. But what he did do is he put his money where his mouth is. He went, bought a plantation in South America, you know, gave his slaves an education. He figured out ways of phasing them into society, both through education, through paying them for their labor and eventually freeing them. Nice. And it's like, that sort of thing came from the the ideals of the enlightenment that he grew up on. Nice. Let me. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's there's so much more with him. You could keep going with him. I can tell. <laughs> yeah. By the way, in your 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 nice video on your website shows there's a love there. Uh, Absolutely. I, I I can identify with that. Hello, and you know what? It's time for a commercial. This is a first things foundation call out to all of you who may be interested in traveling to a very old world place called the Georgian Republic and doing it this fall 2021. We're journeying again. So come with us, embed with us, spend 10 days in early September. Or if you have a group and you'd like to go when you want to go, we can do that too. As long as it's not too much in the depth of winter but let's talk either join us in september and we could talk about specific dates when you get in touch with us or put a group together come to georgia or guatemala or west africa we'll take you to all three places and you can even visit us in appalachia all the places where we work this is the first things foundation kp journey we're journeying again contact us check the pod notes and let's find a way to get you to come with us, see an incredible place, go deep into the old world while helping a bunch of new world cats like ourselves support people around the world and their vision for a better life. That's the First Things Foundation KP Journeys. So Lafayette, give me another one before I ask a question that keeps popping up in my head. I... I think I'm going to go to mm, the milkmaid. You know that painting? Yeah, but go ahead and uh, help us to all understand. What, why so, the milkmaid? That's interesting. Milkmaid, famous painting of a, of a woman pouring milk. The reason I love this is because, like a lot of paintings that, by this particular artist, um, they capture the beauty of everyday life, you know, something so simple. It catches, when you look at the woman's face, you see this contour, this texture, you know, the, the humbleness of the abode, the humility of the, you know, of her house that she's in. It really shines through and it captures this, this really down to earth, everyday beauty yeah. that I think we, we miss out a lot of nowadays. You know, now it's this very produced beauty, this very like, uh, just um, Instagram aesthetic, you know, everything's photoshopped. Mm -hmm. But in day to day life, you know, the most beautiful moments are the cup of coffee that your spouse makes for you in the morning. You mm -hmm. know, it's dropping your kids off at school and, and saying goodbye to them. Yeah. And the milkmaid, I love that it captures this moment of just innocence in, in everyday beauty. So, in both of your examples, it's really interesting. Let's do history for a second you really are hearkening back to some simple enlightenment ideals about individuality hmm. and something about a type of um, rational humility, like kind of seeing the natural world as it really is. But I might argue that the enlightenment begins something that ends in what I think we would both bemoan. You definitely just did, right? <laughs> which is a type of a, sh a shiny self. In wow. other words, we go from a humble self or, or the idea that the self matters, because remember in the East, so Christian art was the dominant art and mm -hmm. it was primarily the icon, which always it rarely showed common people. In fact, never. Yeah. And then we move toward a simple, I, I think you could argue a humble individuality, but 
I might argue it ends in the shiny mm. individualism or in the hyper individualism. Hmm. It might be that that individualism of the West that begins in the, you know, with the Protestant Reformation, it might be that it ends and has to end in the thing both of us might say is rather ugly in hyper individualism. What would you say if someone say like me on this podcast were to go, I'm nervous. There yeah. is a heightened individualism that it might have to end this way. In, in other words, if you rewire with certain elements, you might end up back here. What do you think back about that? Place. Yeah, you know, to be completely fair with you, I think it. I think it's a good argument. You know, I don't. I don't think it's um, completely irrefutable. I think that okay, given certain circumstances, sure, maybe, maybe it is inevitable. I can. I can understand how someone would argue that. I personally don't really think it is. Um, I think that it's still possible to have a more, you know, communal way of, of looking at things where, you know, the milkmaid can be a, a glorification, if you will, not of the individual, but of the values of a community, you know, yes. the, the shared, um, shared culture, that any, any of that sort of thing. I think it can you know, harken back to something that's bigger. It's not about an individual necessarily. You know, it can be about something that we all share, something that we all um, strive to achieve, you know, and live out in our personal life, something so, we all strive to attain as, as a community. I think that you're describing truth, but I, the truth, it feels untethered. So to what degree does your rewiring of the West include or, or must include also some toward, some type of Christian theology. Can we have a rediscovery of beauty without a rediscovery of Christianity in the West? We will leave hmm. Eastern cultures out. We'll leave Hinduism and Islam. Is to rediscover the West to rediscover Christianity. What do you think about that? Yes, I, I will say in terms of just kind of where I'm coming from personally, you know, when it when it comes to questions of the divine, I like to help people figure that out more for themselves than try to necessarily provide my particular answer on that. And kind of going back again, I, I mentioned earlier that the order of what I say is important, beauty, truth, and virtue. I think mm -hmm. beauty leads to virtue. And in the middle of that is truth. With my content, I talk a lot about beauty and virtue and hope that that leads people to truth. I see. And, I see. and I, and I think, you know, I don't try to name that truth. I will say though, what I would, I would say is that, you know, to the very secular audience and really anyone, you know, if, if there is a God, <coughs> I would sure want it to be a God of beauty, truth, and virtue. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't know what else I would, I would want for, for God, you know, it'd right, be for the, for, like, like what else is God? Is, is God not beauty? Is God not truth? Is God, is God not virtue? Right. Um, that would be where I leave things on that front, you know, but, but I think by pointing to beauty and virtue, you get eventually to that truth. So you probably know this, but your conception of something like what a more holistic society would look like, beauty, truth, and virtue, is really close to the ancient understanding of the Trinity, beauty, truth, and love. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's interesting, and that's how I feel about your project, is you really are hearkening back to something that's anchored, and I'm just fascinating where, where it's anchored to, yeah. And it's very possible that it's anchored into rationalism. It's, it's, it's anchored into the beauty of the mind, do, do you think the mind is something that helped you as a 25 year old? Is your mind, your rational mind, when I say mind here, I mean your reason. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that part of what you're using to get to these revealed kind of truths, th these revealed beauty, truth, and virtue, hopes and dreams? Yeah. Um, I, I would say that, you know, of course you, you want to bolster whatever you're talking about intellectually. And so using the mind in that sense, but beauty is something that it, it goes far beyond rationality. So no, I don't, I'm not leaning on my mind if you want to put it that way. That's nice, You know, yeah. beauty, beauty is, I, I've worked a lot with kids 
And beauty is the laugh of a child. It's like, there's something about it that transcends any, any reasoning, you know, it's something that goes beyond all of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Beauty is, you know, love between family members, between friends. It's, it's, it's just um, true, true beauty. You, you just see it and you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't want to over rationalize it. And so to, to that sense, it is absolutely a hundred percent tied to something more transcendental. And what do you hope happens? Do you hope, is this a, is this a project for 20 somings in 2021? Is, is this? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Tell, tell us more about that. What's the yeah. project look like when it's in its most sort of mature state? What are you hoping yeah. for? So this is, you know, I think it's really funny. Um, people from older generations, I don't want to say they don't understand. They, they might not be as in tune to the fact because they grew up in a different time period than I did, you know. But, but like I said, when I went to school, my experience and the experience of everyone else, my other friends, I want to say, you know, was just fed this whole diet of ephemeral to your taste, whatever, mm-hmm. you know, kind of this postmodern, whatever. And everyone is craving something deeper. And I think this is best illustrated. I really like this. I remember maybe about 10 years ago, everyone was just crying out about, oh, like, you know, the traditional forms of religion are going down the drain, like Catholicism, out, Anglicanism, out, like, you know, uh, orthodoxy, out, like kids don't want that anymore. You got to modernize, you know, you got to have the right groups, you got to do this. American, like Protestant Christianity got huge on this train too. Mm -hmm. And then what do you see is not this complete erosion of traditional faith. You actually see an influx of millennials going in the droves to, to orthodoxy, to Catholicism. It's because, specifically because, they, they you know, want something deeper. We, we have that craving. We, we're tired of this ephemeral to your taste, whenever you want it, however you want it. You know, we want something that we have to work for, something that, you know, is bigger than us, something that's going to be around after we leave, something that we can, you know, play into that's a bigger part of us. Wow. So I think so, it's absolutely for kids by it. And you're seeing it. You're, you, you're absolutely. not... Because you're so you're an interesting character to me, because <laughs> you're clearly trying to do what you just described, mm-hmm. and you're not alone, right? So there's this. Okay, I'll just I'll share I'll share my tradition with you for a second, which yeah. is the Eastern Christian Orthodox tradition. There's a a number of elders, saints whatever you want to call them, mystics, who who say that yeah, the world is gonna people are going to bend back toward what you're calling sort of virtue and, and what you're calling beauty, what the Eastern church might call truth. Mm-hmm. And people are going to bend back toward it as, as, as the postmodern experiment hollows out. And what they're trying to do is recover, right? Their, their humanity. Mm-hmm. But then what will happen is, and I don't know what you think about this, is that the powers that be that are fully invested in a, a modern world, a post, mm-hmm. r- really a postmodern world, you could even argue a totalitarian style world, they'll do variations on persecution. Hmm. And that the new religious fervor will quickly die out. And what you'll have left with is very few people actually creating Rewire the West websites. Because deep down, they'll be afraid. So I've heard that narrative. Mm -hmm. So my question, I guess, I believe what you're saying. Do you see people with fervor in their 20s trying to sort this out? Because I do. I've run into some really interesting 20-somethings. Yeah. Do you think there's a, it's, it's an authentic movement or is it simply a reaction, an ephemeral, as you say, an ephemeral reaction to... Um, a pseudo emptiness? Are they just moving away because it's, um, it's, it's their passions or desires, or is there something really deep in the water that's moving 20 somethings toward a, maybe a, a more old world viewpoint? I think there's something deeper. Um, I will say, I hate being cynical, but uh, you know, 
I don't think it's it's about to to change, if you will. You know, kind of what you said, powers that be. I, I will say this, you know, in all of history, we see people people cannot be oppressed forever. They can be though oppressed for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And there can be lots of movements, you know, to to try to reform that get nipped in the bud. There can be lots of things, you know, people are oppressed. But it eventually, you know, you you cannot rule forever. And that's kind of the way that I look at this thing. You know, I don't know if this is the turning point. Honestly, I don't think it is for culture as a whole. I think it is in the lives of individuals, people who are very passionate about living this way. And I think you're going to see it, it breaks my heart, honestly to say that's going this way. I think you're going to see some people lead, lead lives that are completely impoverished on a moral, spiritual, relational, you know, emotional level. And then you're going to see people who are living very counterculturally. You know, I'm putting that between quotes for those who can't see videos, um, mm-hmm. but only in relation to the culture. And these are the ones who are living, you know, meaningful lives mm-hmm. you know meaning are you one of those guys i think you might be gosh i mean one of these countercultural I, I, characters i'm i'm someone who's trying my best you know to to live consciously in the light of beauty truth and virtue what do your friends think of you are uh, they a little weird at times probably do they think you're weird <laughs> i don't think you're weird well, so I mean, so you're kind of that, weird, but not like really. No, weird. I mean, they're they're my friends, so you know they um they um they they see where it's coming from. You know, I think I think a lot of this thing, the biggest comment I've gotten from friends and from people who know me is they say, "Oh, you're really brave." Oh, like, they do say that this, to, to be saying it publicly, and that is kind of maybe going back to what we both talked about at one point mm-hmm. of you know. Um, I think this sentiment is shared by many people, but the climate that's around it right now makes it, it makes people terrified to speak out because if you say, Oh, art has standards and this is complete and art, art, utter garbage, right, right. You, know, you get crucified for it. And it's, and it's ridiculous, but um, it's stuff that shouldn't be hard to, to say, you know, why do you think it's hard? Why do you think you're getting that kind of pushback? And not just you, but other people like, yeah, why should yeah, I, it's hard, but why is it when it shouldn't be? It is, um, it is because non judgmentalism has become the flavor of the day. Yeah. And I think therefore I am has transformed into, I feel therefore I am. Oh, and if someone feels something, then to say, you know, to make a claim on whatever that is, is an assault not on their belief, but on their identity. You know, if it's, I think, therefore I am, it's an assault on the way that they're thinking. You know, I can, we can critique each other ideas all day long, but the second it becomes politicized on a level of identity, you are directly attacking an individual, you know? Okay, so do this, because this is, I can't get away from this idea. Yeah. If I just read the words on your website, which I did, and I talked to you, you seem sane. And, Mm -hmm. and, you're hearkening back or rewiring, rewiring implies something's off. And I get it. But do people think you're conservative, therefore? Do they think, therefore, you like have a MAGA hat? What, what, what happens politically to you when you yeah. make this website? So um, some crazy stuff, some crazy things. Um, some people do think I wear a MAGA hat. Which it's, you know, it's, it's just so insane. I've spent so much of my life, you know, the last, um, the last schools I was, when I was living and working in France, you know, I was working with refugees from Syria, Turkey, the Maghreb, Sub-Saharan Africa, French Dom Toms, overseas territory, like all over. And, and I'm working with them because I have a heart for these individuals. Mm -hmm. And yet I can say something like, Oh, you know, this one piece of contemporary art is garbage. And then they're suddenly, Oh, you want to build the wall. I'm just like, (laughs) what happens? And, um, I've gotten, I've gotten some crazy reactions. The the craziest reaction I got, (laughs) this is insane. Craziest reaction I got. I wrote an article for a classical music, um, site 
about why you should listen to a female composer. Okay. Not like just some generic female composer. I'm not going to say her name, but like a specific female composer that I admired. And I was oh, like, I this see, is why, I see. A this named is why you composer. listen yeah. to her music, you know? And some feminist on Twitter just uh, ripped it to shreds and said that the language throughout was patriarchal, that it was, mm -hmm. you know, like all the, and, and she, she said my, my use of the word, like, still was uh was misogynist i'm just like what like it, it didn't compute at all I'm, i i wrote this article talking about why you should listen to this particular female composer so so language is interesting here i really i really like that example yeah. so so in our work with first things which you know something about we talked about it mm -hmm. earlier before off camera we get we we go and we we immerse and so when we're immersing in various cultures african and central american and Caucas the caucasus we're trying to acquire language and so mm -hmm. i think what's on one level what she's trying to say and it's not a defense of her but i think it's a powerful concept which is you see the language outed you because language has something to do with your with your sort of ontological being with your reality, the reality of who you are. And so it's almost like the language you choose is sort of like the code to your existence, to your rea to, to the realization of, to, to, to reality in terms of who you really are. And I think what people are after in that, in that, in that cultural environment you just described is a total rewiring of you. And there you are trying to rewire the culture that they're trying to give birth to. And so by definition, you really are an enemy of some sort because you're using a language, which I use too, by the way, I get in trouble for this all the time, which almost exposes me because it exposes not just words made into sound, but it exposes like almost like a theology, like a mm -hmm. sense of what is, God to me and yeah. my God doesn't fit with their God. So again, I wonder if your project is by definition going to make you a martyr. Now here means you will suffer. Mm -hmm. And if it is I, like, is that cool with you? Are you ready to go? Or I am I too dramatic? Do I need to calm down and just talk about your ebook and then we get people moving toward your website? You know, I, um, I do not set out wanting to pick fights and, you know, hate on other people. Um, I think people do perceive me, you know, there, there are people out in the world who would perceive me as an enemy to whatever their ideological idea of progress is you know um because you know i, I wish that you weren't being i i wish like i wish that it were dramatic for you to say that but i don't know if it is and in my limited experience i don't know if it is um and i think it's because of you know our, our polarization where it if you don't say exactly what needs to happen you know then it means that it's taken as oh you're on the other side you know if you're not for us you're against us yeah and that's right. kind of you know this happens on both sides it generally is a both sides thing if you're not for us you're against us and um and it just results in stuff that's so dangerous I, i'm a huge fan of the french revolution if you're in history then are, sure are you know. are you oh oh, oh. I, well, yeah i mean i'm not a fan as in like let's go do it again No, I get <laughs> in terms but, of studying but, the period. Right. Yeah. I got you. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. In terms of the period, because there's so is more now more than ever, I think there's so many parallels to what's going on. You know, you have, um, I mean, that's essentially what committee of public safety was doing. And even stuff before that, you know, um, the September oh, massacres agree. and everything was just, yeah. if you're not for us, if you're not 100% towing the exact line of what we want you to say, 
you are an enemy of the revolution. You're an enemy of progress. You're an enemy of the well-being of the people. And we're just going to throw you, literally throw you to the mob, literally throw you to the mob. Yeah. And you saw this, I forget the princess's name, but this was like kind of one of the events that kicked off the September massacres. Mm -hmm. they, they at least had the courtesy of a kangaroo trial. Um, yeah, which sure. later in the revolution, as as you know, they just did away with that altogether. Um, but she at least got the courtesy of a kangaroo trial. And they so said the, the Jacobins of that period, you see them again now around you when you try to talk about mm -hmm. the, your vision on your website. You see the, oh. the Jacobins out in culture coming to chop off yeah. heads. Maybe not literally chop off heads, but cancel heads. You see it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's, and, and I'm not, I'm not even advocating, you know, I, I, I want people to think for themselves that that's all, that's all it is. You know, yeah, it's like such think for yourself, a analyze, analyze this situation, you know, but instead you have slogans like white silence is violence, which is, which is saying literally, you know, if you're not, if you're not saying something, then you are an enemy. It's saying if you are being silent, we they're not taking into account. Maybe it's because you're thinking through the issue. Maybe everything's moving a little fast and you need to really, you know, right. consider your role in this, the, the spot that you play, you know, the position you occupy in society and how you can play into this movement, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. For, for real progress to be made. But no, th that's not considered. It's, it's well, I, 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 yeah, I admire your. So I really like this because you've been really honest. You're, you're, you could see the passion. You can see the reality is that you have been squeezed on some level intellectually. You're, I don't know that you're being persecuted. I don't know about that, but I can see there's something real happening to you in terms of frustration. And I kind of admire your idea of returning to beauty. It, it makes a lot of sense. It, it's calming now, mm -hmm. I think the gamble is that people can understand that there is something eternal and universal about beauty. This is where us Easterners get nervous. So, yeah. Uh, well, well just tell me more about that because yeah. I'm, I'm genuinely interested in that. So, see, I think that you can make an argument there's a narrative, and the narrative begins with the American Revolution, but you can already see it alive and well in some Western philosophical traditions, mm -hmm. including the scholastic traditions of, of, of the, of the Catholic West. And so if you look at the Catholic West in history, you can see uh, derivations from what we, what I would call traditional Christianity. So work with me for a second and we can work. Uh, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. So that's scholastic tradition, but there's others. There's, there's some other philosophical medieval traditions that, that like an atomism, they, they lead to, to a type of Aristotelian science that says that a flower is not a flower. A flower is a stem plus a leaf, plus all the, the, the variable parts. Mm -hmm. And they begin to study the variable parts anyway, without getting too deep into the philosophy. This is also the way theology starts to be done. And, and that gives birth to a type of individualism. And I'm getting to your French revolution because I really appreciate that, what you say. <laughs> nice. And as you move through history <clears throat> in the West, you start to see in the Protestant Reformation, that people start to begin to embrace that atomism as mm -hmm. per their own ontological reality, as per their own self, mm -hmm. as separate from the community, as known unto themselves. And then you get Descartes, right, who does a more yeah. secular version of that. And so what I would say, we don't have to argue at all. I don't really want to do that. But yeah. one of the alternative understandings when it comes to rewiring the West is be careful because the American revolution is actually the first, you have to think of it as like the first fruit, the, 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 the first eruption into actual human history of this full grown idea of individualism. And then quickly on its heel comes the, the French revolution. And then quickly on that the heel of that comes the Bolshevik revolution in Russia. They're mm -hmm. all part of the same conversation which leads to a, a modernism that can't sustain itself, that starts to question itself, and that, that culture can't arrange itself anymore because there's no central principle, which is why I, I wanted you on the show. 
because you're trying to rewire the West. And I love that you say there are central principles. And the central principles you're trying to return to are beautiful words, beauty, truth, virtue. My problem is, is I have a feeling that bathwater got thrown out already hmm. in the sense that to rewire the West is to rebirth the individualist dream, which is utopian in my, in my mindset. It's to give birth again yeah. to a type of atomism in the individual, a type of separateness, a type of idea that I think therefore I am, which just ends up back where we are now. We can get into that or not, but there's this other way of thinking where, where it's, it's Eastern and that the community and the individual are never separate. Um, God is man and man is God. What? That's very foreign in some ways to the Western mindset, the Aristotelian mindset that, right? Everything is its, its constituent part and has its own nature. Yeah. And so we see things connected all the time. But I gave a speech. I wanted to make sure that when you came on, I just think you're just one of the coolest cats out there that, 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 you. that wrote, because I think you're trying to put into action something quite beautiful. I really, and you have that. to have some courage. <laughs> yeah. You have to have yeah. some courage at 25, because I think most people probably aren't even thinking about philosophy. Is that right? Would you argue that? I mean, a, a lot of people are focusing on other stuff. You know, I think um, it's a lot of, kind of sow your wild oats is the the word of the day and and it doesn't it doesn't make much sense they're like oh well in your 20s have fun and then focus on serious stuff later and yeah. it's like well first of all i hate the diff the distinction between fun and serious yes that's right you know, like, Evan. that's right in the first place i don't i don't get that um but also it's like no a, a fun life comes from living you know with with meaning having stuff that you care about stuff that you know really yeah. resonates deep within within you and um why not both i love what you said for something larger yeah um but to go to go to what you're saying yeah sure i i will i will certainly add in case this isn't already clear i don't know how much we've talked about this but i am certainly not a fan of the radical individualism that i believe is you know and you'd probably conclude is tearing apart large portions of our society. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, the first time that was when I, uh, and this is even a, a Western country, Argentina, the first time I went abroad, but at least it was less individualist in America. I mean, that's literally everywhere is less individualist in America, mm -hmm. you know, but that was at 16, that was an impressionable thing um, to see the, the people I lived with just did stuff completely differently, you know, in terms of like, Oh, it's about the family. The family was super important, you know, yeah, yeah. not so much on a societal level as like China, for example, you know, but it, it's super big into the family. And that's at least more than we can say in, in the States, really, um, where, you know, it'd be even it. I, I remember being shocked at the time because they one of the people from, you know, the family I was with uh, still fan, phenomenal, like friends to this day. Um one, one of them was getting home late from work, like 11 p.m. And so the logical answer was we're all going to wait till 11 p.m. to eat dinner. You know, yeah, that was just sure. that's just how it works. Yeah. And, and no one second guessed that. And I was like, yo, I'm hungry, you know, but they're like, no, like this is, you know, something worthwhile. And indeed it was. Indeed it was, <laughs> you know, because because yeah, in right. in life now, it's like we have the chance every day to metaphorically eat at you know, our preferred dining time, mm -hmm. but that brings us no, it brings us no bigger sense of, of yeah. meaning or unity with yeah. anyone else, you know? So I, yeah. I love a more communal approach to living. I think it's very important. You're a, so from our work overseas and just for, I lived a lot of places, you're, you're just appealing to what I think is any, it's just, it's just true. It's just, it's just true. No yeah. matter what people can see or not, is there's a wholeness to that communitarian value. It's just, unfortunately, communitarian has been hijacked in some ways by the political sphere, right? And, and turned into communism. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. which is really not the same concept at all. And that's why on here, we always, on this podcast, we always talk about the old world. Because while the old world practiced variations on communitarianism and the idea that people are related and must be related to one another, they never practice communism. It's a different, it's a different animal. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what's really interesting, if if you don't mind me adding this, sure. is that in lots of ways, the communal values, the, the way that community was supported in the old world, um, if I can say that, it got replaced by a different set of communal values, you know, like more kind of top down help, but in a way that actually eroded the 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 original communal aspect. I'm going to explain what I mean by that real fast because I did not explain that well. What <laughs> I mean is that, like, for example, the monasteries in England, okay, I'm just going to use this example because this is what I know. They were the, the social, like, fabric that held so much of, you know, England's poor together. It, w- it was the church. It was the monasteries. And, you know, if you didn't have somewhere to go, that's where you went. The second that English society started to transform into, okay, hey, you know, we're going to have the government start helping us, mm-hmm. um, which it, I'm not, I'm not, I, I don't want to draw parallels with our day and age. I just want to talk about this specific time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, when that transition started to happen, then people actually said, you know, oh, they started to drift apart because they didn't need each other. anymore. You know, they said, oh, well, I'm getting it, you know, from the government. And then in some cases, they even went so far as to say, um, you know, I'm not going to help you anymore because you're getting it from someone else, at least in theory, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, But I know that, uh, you know, to put to give another example in in Thailand, uh, I believe I'm trying to think where the guy was from. I believe he was Thai. I was talking to one guy who's who's a businessman in Thailand. And basically they have absolutely no judicial backing of the vast majority of business that's going on. Okay. And, um, and so basically trust is the, is the currency of the day. You know, like if you don't have trust, you are absolutely nothing. You have no future. Okay. And so the second though, that like laws start getting implemented, then you can kind of afford to break some of that because because now you have a court that's kind of looking out for you, you know, like stuff can be litigated. Yeah. And so I'm not saying it's inherently bad. I don't want to say like, oh, we, we don't need a, a justice system or we don't need courts, you know, but look at like America versus one of these emerging markets. You know, we have people breaking contracts all the time and going to court all the time for it. And, yeah. you know, good for us. We have a system to do that. But in other places, it's like, man, you know, trust you have to be a person of trust. well evan to illustrate your point uh for about five years now we've been sending people to live overseas and also now in appalachia and oh. it, yeah we work in an appalachia in western uh, carolinas and here's the thing just perfect illustration i think is in all that time we've lived in lots of neighborhoods always in traditional neighborhoods including in appalachia we have signed zero contracts for lease people don't do it yeah wow <laughs> live fine and with a handshake because hmm. if you introduce a contract in some of those cultures then what happens is is they actually become suspicious because the contract implies right and it it, Im, it implies a lack of trust mm-hmm. and so yeah. right away you get like you said you you become outside you become put on the outside yeah I think is a pretty good illustration. Will you do a test with me before we finish up? Absolutely. Yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm super torn on all that you're, you're, you're saying because I really see both sides, but mostly your courage is emboldening. It's nice. It's good to see, but you know, who knows? Maybe both of us are crazy. Who knows? <laughs> I want to find out where you fall on our light. O meter. 10 is your number. 10. Would you like to know what that qualifies you as? I'm scared. On the light of me. The rest of my life. Let's do it. Okay. You're not the Charlemagne. That would be if you had scored a 15. You're not full retro. Hmm. Right? You don't think the old world is the only world, but you're not a villager either. That would have been a 12 or 13 or 14. So it's not totally in your own in your in your bones the old world 
But hmm. you are the suburbanite. Ooh. You feel romantic about the old world, but hierarchy is a word that you'd rather read about in a book. It feels like you should want to obey your elders a lot more than you actually do. The individual is not more important than the group, except, well, sometimes you feel way more important than lots of dumb people in dumb groups. So there is that. You are the suburbanite. Now, you're not the shiny city dweller on the hill, and you're not the high nooner. That would be someone who is very, very new world. Gotcha. You're in the middle. You're in the middle, man. I hope people will tune in uh, to what Evan's doing over on his YouTube site, which you can find on our pod notes. Do you want to tell anybody about anything before we sign off, brother, that, that you want them to know about your work? Yeah. At, um, at the deepest level, you know, we kind of got into some issues that are unfortunately really politicized in our society today. At the heart of this is it's not, it's not political and I don't have political aspirations and I don't seek to incite anyone to that. I, I do it out of a, you know, means of hope, really. I think beauty, truth, and virtue is what allows us, you know, living by those things gives us the hope to endure life's hardships. Mm -hmm. It gives us the ability to, to live more meaningfully, to help others, to make the world a better place and ultimately, you know, lead to the flourishing of families and communities. And, and um, this is... Waktar, Shani Zagagi Marjos to you, Evan. That means to you the victory often set at the KP table. Uh, that's in the Georgian Republic. That's our pod for today. Thanks for coming along. Nakwam Dees, peace to you. And Evan, thanks for coming on. Peace out. Thank you. <laughs>